Hello everyone, my name is Haley Elizabeth and if you don't know who I am, I post videos pertaining to a little bit of whatever I want. Conspiracy theories, true crime, vlogs, so if you're into any of that you can subscribe and if not, totally fine, like you can just hang out with the rest of us. We, we love new people here so you know, just hop in, hop out whenever you want. Today, we are gonna be talking about the case of Stephanie and Craig Rabinowitz. I've heard people pronounce it differently, but I do wanna thank the sponsor of today's video, Casetify. Now, if you guys don't know what Casetify is, Casetify is a phone case brand that offers over hundreds of different styles, and they're extremely durable, and I've had this case on my phone for the longest time. It is the Ultra Impact, and you can tell that it's Ultra Impact because of the ridges on the corner. I were to literally drop this, my phone would be protected. Oh yeah, and also on top of that, Casetify also comes with a screen protector as well. So that is literally just double the protection on your phone. They also have cases kind of ranging to whatever you're into. So whatever fits your aesthetic the best. Honestly, Casetify is the only like phone case brand that I've ever found that is not only durable, but also really cute. Sometimes you find a really cute phone case online, but then it comes in the mail and it's super flimsy and you feel like you don't even have a case on at all. But with Casetify, you never ever feel like that. You can flip it around, drop it, and it will stay intact. Tastify also has a large range of different phones that can provide these cases, so it doesn't matter if you have an Android or an iPhone. Tastify will hook you up and make sure your phone is dressed to impress. Tastify also, on top of all of that, has a wide selection of customizable phone cases. So you literally just go online, choose their customizable phone cases, and type whatever word you want on your phone case. You can also choose pictures and personalize your phone cases which again I think is really really cool because customizable phone cases you get that from any other website and it's gonna come in like cardboard you know like it's not gonna be durable but with Casetify they are durable. Casetify is actually hooking it up for all of you guys who are watching this video right now if you click the link in the description box below or go to casetify.com slash Haley you will receive 15% off your next purchase of Casetify. Again thank you so so much to Casetify for sponsoring today's video video. All right, sorry about that. Um, anyway, there is a lot to get through with this case, so let's just hop right into it. Stephanie Paula Newman was born on June 3rd, 1967 in Marion Park, Pennsylvania. She grew up with her mother, Anne, her father, Louie, and her younger brother. When Stephanie was a teenager, she was labeled as a go-getter. She was very, very intelligent. She had really good grades. She had a very bubbly personality. She was definitely the type of person that was friends with everyone every single friend group. She never really like kept herself to one single group. She was also very spontaneous. She's kind of the type of friend that just texts you randomly in the day and is like, hey, do you want to go downtown and have a picnic? Or do you want to go skydiving, get tickets and go water skiing? You know, she was just the type of person that was down to do anything. And throughout high school with her good grades, she was destined to do something big and she really wanted to be a doctor until she realized that she had a needle phone Phobia. So the sight of needles just freaked her out and she realized that that is not something that she wanted to do. So instead, she decided to pursue law. 1983, when Stephanie was 16 years old, she got a part-time job as a camp counselor where she met 20-year-old Craig Rabanowitz. He was also a camp counselor, but not at her camp, but a camp down the street. Stephanie's little brother actually attended Craig's summer camp. So sometimes if she was like picking up her little brother, she would see him in passing until one day he went over to her camp for some sort of event and that's when they actually started talking. Immediately when they met, Stephanie really, really liked Craig. She thought that since he was older, he was 20 and she was 16. He went to college, he went to Temple University. So she saw him as like very intelligent, very smart. He had a car and apparently Craig felt the same exact way for Stephanie because he ended up asking her out on a date to a movie, which she accepted. So they went to the movie and then about a week later, he asked her to go to a Philadelphia Flyers game. And prior to this date, she said yes, because it was kind of like in the moment. But later on that night, she actually told her mom that she doesn't really feel like she wants to go. She feels like the first date, it was okay. And so when she was telling her mother all of this, her mom was like, you know, you don't have to go if you don't want to, but I think it's a good idea to just give him a second chance. And if by 
a second chance, you still don't like him, then you don't have to hang out with him anymore. She eventually did go to the Flyers game, and I don't know what happened on this date, but it completely shifted her view on Craig. She completely saw herself with someone like Craig, and Stephanie was also a really big hopeless romantic. She always dreamed of herself in this big suburban house with her husband, her baby, a nice job, nice cars, and she felt like Craig could kind of bring that dream to life for her. Two years later, when Stephanie was 18 and Craig was 22, uh, Craig actually dropped out of college. He dropped out of Temple University. I couldn't really figure out why he completely dropped out. And as he was dropping out of college, Stephanie was entering college. She first went to Brian Mauer College and then later on went to, ironically, Temple University. But Temple University also had a law school and that is what she attended. But then after seven years of dating, in 1990, that is when Craig and Stephanie decided to tie the knot and they got married. It was also around this time where Stephanie was finishing up her law degree. And as you can tell, Stephanie definitely has like dreams and goals for herself. But as for Craig, he had dreams for himself, but no goals. So he dreamed of himself having all these cars and all these houses, a luxury lifestyle, all this money. But when it actually came to the goal part of how he was gonna get there. He was just super lazy and he, he wanted the reward without the work basically. It was very apparent that Stephanie was going to be the breadwinner of the family and Craig didn't like that. He didn't want his wife paying for everything. So that is when he created a business with his friend also named Craig and it was called C&C Vending and basically what they did is they took latex gloves like medical gloves and they shipped it out to different hospitals and clinics and that was a company that they started in hopes of it getting big. And in 1992 Stephanie actually graduated her law school with honors and that is when she became a Philadelphia attorney. So during 1992 it's been two years into CNC vending and it's just not really taking off as much as Craig thought it would and it was also gonna cost around $88,000 to actually start up it completely so they needed investors and nobody was investing in them. There was really really no clients that they had lined up for when they did have the money. Instead of the business, uh, Craig just kind of worked odd jobs. So he worked in retail, he worked as a real estate broker, he worked at a spa, he was a manager of a spa for a while. So since Craig was just kind of working all these odd jobs, Stephanie's parents, Anne and Louie, they kind of felt very indifferent about Stephanie being the breadwinner, which there is no, <laughs> there is no problem with the girl being the breadwinner of the family. Absolutely no problem. But the parents, they felt like Craig was just kind of using Stephanie's money without even trying to get some of his own. She paid the bills, she made good money, she had her own car, but they also wanted Craig to work for himself as well. But Stephanie's parents never actually said this to Stephanie because they said that every time they saw Stephanie and Craig together, they were very much in love. They were very lovey towards each other. Craig made Stephanie super, super happy. So the parents just kind of stayed quiet. They didn't want to, you know, ruin Stephanie's feelings or anything. Later on the following year in 1993, this is actually when Craig's business really started to take off. He was making 30 to 40% profit. And the reason why his business was doing so well all of a sudden is because he actually had the $88,000 that he needed for the business. And so how he got it was through multiple things. A lot of the money from various investors, family and friends, but there was that little chunk of money at the end that they didn't really have that he really, really needed. So Stephanie, being the angel that she is, she really believed in Craig. She was like, okay, like this is your dream. I'm gonna help you achieve it. So she put their house up for collateral. Now, I didn't know what putting your house up for collateral was. You take out a loan and the bank's like, okay, you're taking out this loan. How do we know that you're actually gonna pay us back? And and then you put something up for collateral such as a house and you're like okay if I don't pay back this loan here's my house that's how you know I'll pay you back nonetheless he got the money $88,000 it took a while to get there they were so in debt at one point actually they had to move in with Steph's parents because they were $6,000 in debt of the rent that they owed and the landlord was threatening to sue them so they moved out and moved in with Steph's parents but they didn't tell Steph's parents the real reason why they moved there. They basically 
basically just said, oh, we're trying to save up for our dream home, when in reality, they were very much in debt and the landlord was gonna sue them if they didn't leave. But that was like in previous years, in 1993, as we're talking about right now, Craig's business is really taking off. Stephanie's attorney job is really taking off. So they're really starting to redeem themselves financially. 1995, that is when Stephanie was like, okay, I'm done with the apartments. I want a house because I don't wanna raise a child in this apartment. I wanna raise a child in a home with a backyard. As I said, she had this dream to live in a suburban home with her husband and her baby. And that's exactly what she got. They moved into the suburbs of Marion Park of Pennsylvania. That's where she's from. And so they got a little suburban house. And in 1996, that is when they had their very first child named Haley. As far as like the neighborhood itself, the neighborhood was a really, really nice neighborhood, very friendly. It was the type of, you know, neighborhood where everybody had block parties and everybody was going to each other's houses. You know, all the moms would like power walk in the morning. Everyone absolutely loved Stephanie and Craig. Everyone thought that they were just the dream couple. All the girls had a crush on Craig and thought that he was a dream husband and Stephanie was a dream mother. They were just the couple that everybody wanted to hang out with. Right after they had Haley, uh, Stephanie really wanted to spend more time with her. I don't want to be a mom that's not there all the time. Like I really want to spend a lot of time with her. She took her full-time position and moved it to part-time. And this full-time to part-time switch really affected them financially because they were making, you know, half as much money as they were before. Instead of working five days a week, she was only working Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, which was completely fine with her because more time with her daughter made her really, really happy. And also Craig's business was really booming. Like it was making a lot more money than it was before. So he was able to kind of pick up what they had lost. It seemed like everything was really going well for the couple. That is until on April 29th of 1997, that is when Craig calls the police in a panic and tells the police that he just found his wife, Stephanie, dead in their bathtub. When paramedics arrive, they say that Craig was screaming and crying. He was freaking out and all of this commotion actually woke up Haley. So whilst he went to go calm her down, he came back and the paramedics were taking her down the stairs and to the hospital. Craig followed the paramedics to the hospital and when he got there, he started calling all of his family and friends, telling them what happened and that he believes Stephanie probably isn't going to make it. So whilst Craig is at the hospital, the police are still at the house, just kind of taking a look around with the paramedics. But this scene, so Craig had to fill out a statement. And so the police were looking at Craig's statement and looking at the scene and realizing that it didn't really match up. There was a part in Craig's story where he said that when he first saw Stephanie, he jumped in the water and was trying to pull her out, but couldn't conjure up the strength to do so but when they looked at the bathtub there was no splashing anywhere around the bathtub they also thought that it was really odd that Craig couldn't pull Stephanie out of the bathtub because you tend to weigh a lot less when you're underwater thought that it was really odd that Craig being a bigger guy and Stephanie being a small petite girl that he wasn't able to just pick her up out of the water and they were just kind of compiling a bunch of these weird things that they noticed so then back at the hospital all of Stephanie Stephanie's family and friends rushed to the hospital to make sure that Stephanie was okay, but unfortunately, Stephanie ended up not making it. Typically, when someone passes away, the doctors allow the family and friends to go in the room and say their last goodbyes, and Craig said that he could not go in there and say goodbye, mostly because he couldn't face her parents, which was really odd, but, you know, you can't really judge someone about going through a situation if you've never been through that same situation yourself. Stephanie's family was actually Jewish, so in a very common thing to do, when someone dies, you bury them before the next sundown, so they wanted to bury bury Stephanie before the next sundown and they were going to do that because on the surface it just looked like she drowned herself. There was no visible injuries until there was one medical examiner that actually noticed some light bruising around Stephanie's neck and that for some reason just kind of gave him a very deep pit in his stomach. He was like, no, I have to perform an autopsy. There is something else going on here. So he declines the family's wishes to bury 
bury her by sundown and did an autopsy. When he started the autopsy, it had been about 10 hours since she passed away, so the body was still super fresh. He noticed broken blood vessels in her forehead, and typically when you have broken blood vessels in your forehead, that means that your air was cut off at some point, which makes sense because at this point they assumed that she was drowning. There was slight bruising around her neck that indicated a strangulation. Bruises found on her elbows and knees, which is a sign of a struggle, as if she was trying to fight someone off. They also did a toxicology report and found high doses of Ambien. Now, Ambien, aka uh, Zolipidem, for those who don't know, is like a sleeping pill. It helps treat people with insomnia. There was also a lot of undigested food in her system, which was very odd because Craig said that they went out to dinner that night with Steph's parents at around 9.30, and he called the police at 12 p.m. That's like a two and a half hour window to digest your food, and from this, it looked like it was only digested for about an hour, making her time of death at 10.30, which would leave a hour and a half window of, you know, what was going on during that hour and a half. Very next day, Craig gets called into the police station for just a little bit of questioning, simple questions about what he saw, and weirdly, when Craig came into the station, he actually brought his friend with him that was a lawyer, and that right off the bat is super odd. Already knew that they were going to point it as a murder and point him as a suspect. As far as Craig's timeline of events, this is how he said the night went down. But during the day, Steph and her mother went out shopping. Her and her mom were very, very close, so every weekend they would go shopping together. After they went shopping, uh, Stephanie came back home and hung out with Craig for a little bit. And between 9 and 9.30, they went out and had dinner with Steph's parents at a Thai restaurant. After dinner, Steph's parents went back to Stephanie and Craig's house just to hang out for a little bit. And whilst Stephanie, Craig, and Steph's parents were all sitting there, Craig realized that he had a lot of caffeine that day, so he was kind of jittery and shaky. So he decided to take his daughter, Haley, out for a walk around the block. So he put Haley in the stroller, took her a walk around the block, and then when he came back, Steph's parents were gone. At this point, it's around 11 o'clock. So he puts Haley up to bed and then he cracks open a beer for him and Stephanie. And they both go upstairs to their bedroom. Stephanie picks out her clothes for the next day. And then she says that before she wants to go to bed, she wants to take a bath. So Craig stays in the bedroom just watching the hockey game and she goes into the bathroom and he says that at one point he actually heard a thump in the bathroom but he just assumed that it was a shampoo bottle falling or something so he didn't really think too much of it. About 20 minutes go by and he realizes that like the bathroom is a little bit too quiet. There's been no noise like not even any splashing or anything in there. He starts to grow a little bit concerned so he goes in there just to check up on her and that is when he finds her submerged underwater and he runs over there. He tries to jump in and try to pull her out but for some reason he was just so scared that he lost all muscle and he just could not bring her out of the water. He tried to hold her head above water. He ran to his office to call the police. After he called the police, he gave them his address. He ran downstairs to the front door to unlock it for the paramedics and then he ran back upstairs to the bathroom and just tried to hold her head above water. The police asked him if he attempted at CPR or any sort of mouth-to-mouth -mouth, but he said that he didn't know how to do that so he never did that. They also asked Craig if Stephanie was on any medications and he said that Stephanie wasn't on any medications but he recently just got prescribed Ambien for his insomnia but that was like the only drug, prescription drug that was in the household. Police asked Craig about their life insurance policy and what does their life insurance policy look like and Craig just answered this question way too quickly. Like he already had the numbers in the back of his pocket. There was an insurance policy for Stephanie for $1.5 million. There was an insurance policy on himself for $1.2 million. There was another one for Stephanie for $500,000, another for him for $150,000, and then Stephanie also got benefits from work. Towards the end of the interview, that is when the interrogators start to heckle Craig a little bit. 
They tell Craig that they actually found slight bruising around Stephanie's neck as if she was strangled and Craig just kept on saying, I don't know what you're talking about. I had nothing to do with that. And the police were like, well, apparently you did unless someone broke into the house. And he was like, I don't know, maybe someone did break into the house. And the police were like, well, how did they break into the house if the front door was locked and we found no forced entry into the household? So as the police were trying to like close in on him a little bit, uh, Craig's lawyer friend literally just got up and said, we're done here. Craig and his friend left and that was really odd for police because again, it's like, it kind of felt like maybe the friend even knew something. They decide to get a search warrant for Craig's house. So when they're searching around the house, they don't really find anything significant. They don't find any signs of foul play, any signs of a struggle, any breaking and entering. They don't even find the ambient either. All they really took was a couple papers and documents from Craig's office, but even those papers just had nothing significant on it. Maybe this was just a suicide and we're thinking too far into it. That is until the day of Stephanie's funeral, the police received an anonymous call from a man saying that if they are looking into anything, they should probably look into the gentleman's club Delilah's because he said that he was a frequent goer at Delilah's and he saw Craig there a lot and he was actually in relations with one of the exotic dancers named Summer. They were like, okay, whoa, that's, that's really specific. And so then they go down to Delilah's and they talk to the manager and a couple of the regulars and all of them said, yeah, Craig has been coming here multiple times a week for the past year. Whenever he refers to the exotic dancer Summer, he always says that she's his girlfriend. They said that it wasn't a secret either. Like they would always be talking to each other, hugging on each other when they were at the bar or eating food. And every single time Craig would go to Delilah's, he would spend so much money. He would spend $500 on food for lunch a couple times a week. And then on top of that, he would buy a $280 bottle of champagne. And as I said, Stephanie just went from full-time to part-time. So they had no money to just be spending. Uh, they also said that whenever Craig would go to Delilah's, he would always go to the champagne room specifically. Now the champagne room is something that's very exclusive to members only. So once you go there enough and you spend enough money, they know that you're a good customer. You're very respectful. You're not super handsy or anything. You you are eligible for an exclusive champagne room card. This exclusive room, you can also eat food, like go to lunch, but Delilah's currency system was meant to be very under the radar because whenever you would spend money on things like food or drinks, it would go through these things called Delilah bucks and you would purchase Delilah bucks through a credit card, it would come up on your debit or credit card as D and D restaurant, not Delilah's Gentleman Club. Although it came up as D and D restaurant, Stephanie kind of grew concerned of like why is he spending over a thousand dollars a week at this D and D restaurant? That's really odd because we don't have the money for that. So Steph actually confronted him one time, and he just said that he was going there to appeal a New York investor, and every time they. Would would hang out. He always felt like it was respectable if he paid for the meal. So Stephanie just kind of didn't say anything. She just stayed quiet. She was like, okay, if you feel like this investor is going to get us our money back, then do whatever you need to do. So the police actually show up to Summer, whose name was Shannon Rainhart. She was a 24-year-old exotic dancer. She'd been working at Delilah's at this point for five years, and she was one of the top dancers. Everyone would always ask for her. She was a very very highly paid dancer. All the men in the club really enjoyed her. So the police actually showed up to Summer's house. And when they showed up to her house, she opened up the door and she just told the police flat out, I'll answer any questions you want me to answer. But by the way, I have a friend who's a lawyer and he should be here any minute. I want to point out because 
my god, literally things hit my brain and then it doesn't actually process till 20 hours later. The difference between Craig's situation of having a lawyer right off the bat and Summer having a lawyer right off the bat, Craig didn't really need a lawyer right off the bat, but as for Summer, Summer is an exotic dancer and this is also during the 90s, which I mean it hasn't really gotten better since the 90s unfortunately. The law enforcement is extremely disrespectful to exotic dancers. They treat them like they're not human beings. They always disregard their stories. They always treat them less than and it's disgusting and so that is why Summer had a lawyer right off the bat which was extremely smart because she didn't want the law enforcement to take advantage of her or basically just pin this crime on her when she had nothing to do with it. It was a really good move for her to bring a lawyer right off the bat just in case if things got too uncomfortable or the questions just didn't have to do with the case, she would have a friend there to kind of help her out. So they go to her house, they're just kind of creating small conversation with her and one of the detectives compliments Summer on her furniture and she goes, oh thank you, Craig bought it for me. At that same moment, um, that's when Summer's lawyer friend shows up and apparently Summer's lawyer friend knew one of the detectives. They asked Summer like, wait, Craig bought this furniture for you? And she goes, yeah, Craig used to buy me a lot of stuff. He bought me jewelry, furniture, clothes. When's the last time you saw Craig? And she says that the last time she saw Craig was a couple days ago at Delilah's. Uh, he was in the parking lot and he was waiting for for Summer to show up to her shift. As soon as she got out of her car, Craig approached her and was like, hey Summer, I need to talk to you. And she's like, okay, okay, just let's walk and talk because I'm late to my shift. So that's when Craig reveals the news to Summer that his wife had passed away. So Summer said that when she heard that, she just stopped dead in her tracks and she looked at him and started crying. And she didn't really know why she was really crying. She didn't know Stephanie, but she felt like since he had talked about his wife so much to her that she kind of felt like she knew her. She was saying that she was super sorry for him and what's gonna happen to Haley, what's gonna happen to the house? How is he going to afford everything? Like she was just really concerned for him. But when the police asked Summer about their relationship, she denied any sort of relationship. She said that they were just only friends. They never had any sexual contact with each other. He was just a good paying customer and a good friend. Whenever he would pay her like for services, he wouldn't even want sexual services. He just wanted company and he just wanted to talk to her and just get to know her her. Often a uh, rant about his marital issues to Summer. He said that he still loves Stephanie but he's not in love with her anymore and he's scared to leave her because he knows that if he were to leave her that he would have no money. The only time they hung out outside of the club was uh, for him to buy her that furniture. Craig has said a couple times to Summer as well that he sees Summer as the perfect wife. He always told Summer that she was really Really beautiful. Summer says that these comments never really made her feel uncomfortable or anything. She actually described him to be a great father in a bad marriage. She says that she can't really speak for Craig and say that Craig had feelings for Summer, but Summer denies any feelings that she had for Craig. She said that he was definitely not like her highest paying customer. Like she had other guys that she would talk to all the time. So to her, he was just kind of a friend slash customer and nothing more. And that is when the detectives ask Summer the million dollar question and they ask her if she believes that Craig killed Stephanie and Summer says no. So they walked away from that interview kind of defeated because they thought that they were gonna get a lot more information. They didn't really find anything too of significance. So after the police feel a little defeated, they're like, okay, there has to be something else. Like there is something here. We just don't know where it's at. Like we need to find it. So that is when they go for a second search in Craig's house. They get another search warrant. Again, it's the same thing as last time. They can't really find anything until they go into Stephanie and Craig's room and they actually see on the top of Stephanie's closet, it's one of those like panels where you can push up and put things in. So they push it up and they realize that there's a lot of things in there. They found XXX magazines and a bunch of receipts for jewelry as well as a pawn receipt the day after Stephanie 
had passed away, Craig went to the pawn shop and pawned all of Stephanie's great grandmother's jewelry that had been passed down to Stephanie. He just went to the pawn shop and pawned all of it the day after Stephanie had passed away. He also found all of the receipts and apparently he had given Summer over $6,000 worth of gifts such as jewelry and clothes and furniture. And although they found these magazines and these receipts, this really wasn't evidence that pointed him to the crime. It just made him look like a bad person. Being a bad husband is not illegal. They had to get something more to pin him as a murderer other than Playboy magazines and receipts up in a closet because that's not enough. They then hired a forensic accountant and a forensic accountant basically goes through all of the financial accounts. This forensic accountant looked into all of Craig's financial statements and found out that his business wasn't actually doing as well as he said it was. He all around owed over $500,000 to his investors. Even though he owed all of this money to his investors, he was currently paying all of his investors back. And this kind of confused the forensic accountant because they thought, okay, well, how is he paying all of his investors back $500,000 worth if he has no money to begin with? Where is this money even coming from? They also look into all of the charges at Delilah's. Again, if he's so in debt, where is this money coming from? That is when they found out that a month prior to Stephanie passing away, Craig called their bank and asked to access Stephanie's life insurance policy before Stephanie had even passed away. So it takes about a month to access a life insurance policy. So it kind of looks like that he timed his crime out so that when Stephanie passed away, he would have enough money right then and there to like leave the country or something. So this just kind of begs another more question of how did it even get here? Because in the beginning, CNC vending were apparently taking off, making 30 to 40% profit. All of these investors from friends and families, he would go on business trips for this business. As they're digging deeper into this company, they realize that there was no such thing as CNC vending. The business was never created. He had no business. He never sold latex gloves to clinics. He basically just scammed investors so that he could get all of their money and spend it and then just never pay them back. And that's how he was living. And that's why he ended up being $500,000 in debt. Once he realized that he can't really get any more investors, that's when he opened up the life insurance policy to pay everyone back. Also, we're looking through other financial documents where they found that Craig had created a spreadsheet of all of the money that he would get from the life insurance policies. And then he was subtracting how much money he owed to certain people. And then by the end of everything, after everyone was paid, he would have around $1.2 million. And at the end, he circled it in red as if he was proud that that is how much money he was going to pocket after killing his wife, essentially, which is so disgusting. But this was definitely a bigger piece of evidence that showed the motive was clearly money. Because why would you be calculating life insurance policies if your wife or husband isn't dead yet? On May 5th of 1997, six days after the death of Stephanie, that is when Craig was arrested for the murder of Stephanie. On October 30th of 1997, that is when his trial began. In the courtroom was all of Stephanie's family and friends. And unfortunately, just the prior month on September September 28th, that is when Stephanie's father had passed away. So Stephanie's mother not only lost her daughter, but also lost her husband in the same year. For the longest time, Craig was pleading not guilty. That is why they had a trial in the first place. But then at the last second, Craig's lawyer walked into the courtroom and said that Craig is going to plead guilty. A 
as soon as he pled guilty, that's when the trial was done. Because if you committed a crime and you say, yes, I committed the crime, there's really no point for a trial because what's the point of showing evidence when that person completely just said that they did it? And a lot of people within this case said that the reason why Craig decided to plead guilty is because he knew that the evidence from the crime would be made public and he didn't want to sit there in front of everyone and watch all of his crimes play out and watch him just be a bad person essentially. So he thought that it would be easier if he just pled guilty and he didn't have to deal with any of that embarrassment, any of that shame, like looking at the family. He didn't have to deal with that. Similar to how when everybody was saying their goodbyes to Stephanie, he didn't want to go in the hospital room because he didn't want to deal with her parents. It seemed like he just didn't want to feel guilty or ashamed for what he did. He actually stood up in front of the court and was able to give a statement to Stephanie's family. He said that the night before, Stephanie had came to him in a dream and the dream felt so real and he walked into their dining room and he saw Stephanie, her father, and his father and her and his father were both dead at this time. Stephanie looked at Craig, she got up and she held his hands in her hands, which again felt super, super real. And she basically just told him it's time to do the right thing. And so when he woke up, that is when he called his lawyer and said that he wanted to plead guilty. He was given a life sentence without possibility of parole. Now, although he is in prison, he pled guilty at the last second, so there is so many unanswered questions. He never actually gave the real timeline of events, so even to this day, nobody knows why Stephanie had bruising on her neck. Nobody knows why she had bruising on her knees and elbows. No one knows how she even got in the bathtub in the first place. If he tried to beat her and then he drowned her, but even if he was drowning her, there would at least be some sort of splashing around the tub. No explanation for the Ambien as well because they found high doses of Ambien. Maybe he spiked the beers that he gave her, but that really doesn't line up with the timeline, the digested food. It makes the time of death at around 10.30 and he says that he was sharing a beer with Stephanie at 11 o'clock. Even if she was dead by 11.20, the sleeping pills wouldn't have worked that quick. It was speculated that he was trying to get all of the life insurance policy, the $1.2 million, so that when Stephanie passed away, it was around the same time that he was able to access all of the money and he could then run away with Summer. Even a lot of people today believe and speculate that there was definitely something more going on with Summer and Craig's relationship. Witnesses at Delilah's, they said that Summer and Craig were always around each other. They were always having lunch with one another. Like they were very lovey towards one another as if they were dating. So they don't know if maybe Summer was just playing that part for the money or maybe she actually did have feelings for him. All these unanswered questions because he pled guilty and he never told the true story of what happened that day. As far as the aftermath, uh, he is currently still in prison, still serving his time in Pennsylvania. Uh, as far as Haley, Haley was then raised by Stephanie's mother, her grandmother. Haley, as of currently, would be 26 years old, so I hope that she is just coping the best that she can. I hope that she had a very fulfilling childhood despite what happened to her. I hope she's successful. I hope she's rich. I hope she's in love. I hope she is living the best life she can. And as far as Summer, after the incident, she never really like spoke to the press except for one interview. She said that Craig was the perfect husband and the most perfect father in the most unperfect marriage. She also says that she misses him dearly as a client and a friend. There was also speculation of Craig having other women as well, not just Summer. The only thing that they really had to back that up is in the ceiling when they found all of the receipts, they found a receipt for a Tiffany's store on Valentine's Day, but that necklace that he bought and was never given to Stephanie or Summer. Also later found out, like, 
like after the trial and stuff that um, all of his business trips that he would go on, since there was no business, he wasn't going on business trips. He would basically just uh, buy the presidential suite at hotels. Some people believe that maybe he had another woman that he would bring to these suites or it was possibly summer that he would bring to this these suites. So that's where everyone is at now. And that is the end of today's story. So if you guys found this video interesting, you can give it a like and subscribe. If you wanna follow me on any of my socials, like my Instagram, that will be linked down below, as well as my PO box if you want to send me anything. And as well as well, all of the sources that I mentioned in this video, I'm gonna start doing this from now on because I always get like Instagram DMs or sometimes YouTube comments of people being like, oh, I'm doing like a school project on this specific story. Can you tell me some of the sources that you use, like the articles and the documentaries? So from now on, as I'm researching, I'm just going to be saving all of the articles and documentaries that I watch. And then when I upload the video, I'm going to put all of the sources down below. So if you guys, you know, are doing a school project and you want to know about the case, or you're just curious and you want to learn more about the case, all of the sources will be linked down below for you to read. I always say, if you want to follow me on any of my socials. Instagram is the only social media I have besides YouTube. I haven't had TikTok in a couple of months. I used to have Snapchat. Again, I don't have Snapchat anymore. I don't have Twitter anymore. I'm never really on my phone either. What's my screen time? Average screen time is three hours. Can you see that? So I'm barely on my phone really. I mostly am just reading, filming, editing, or researching. And that is my life. Um, and honestly, I'm comfortable with that. I think that's all I have to say. So with that being said, I love you, I love you, I love you. And do something that makes you 